This presentation is called The Return of the Group. And we're going to be discussing the work of two biologists with the last name of Wilson, so it can be helpful to distinguish them. One of these Wilsons is Edward O. Wilson, who's famous for his studies of insect societies. And his most recent and accessible work on social evolution is his 2012 book, The Social Conquest of Earth. The second Wilson is David Sloan Wilson, who's written a lot about human societies and particularly religion. And his most accessible book is Darwin's Cathedral, published in 2002. So what was group selection? Well, as we've discussed, the idea behind group selection was that what happens is for the good of the species, but more broadly, it was this sense that everything that happens is somehow for the benefit of all. And this is the line of thinking that the biologists who came to be called Neo-Darwinians rejected. And as David Sloan Wilson argues, in the 1960s, a consensus emerged that group selection is such a weak force that it can be ignored. And this derived from the work of neo-Darwinians like George Williams. As you'll recall, there were three key points in the neo-Darwinian critique of group selection. And the first was simply pointing out that there's no reason to think that what benefits one individual will also benefit another. So we can expect conflict between individuals, even if they're full siblings, much less if they belong to the same species. The second point they made is that what's best for an individual isn't necessarily what's best for the group as a whole and vice versa. So there's no reason to think that selection is simply going to be able to find the best outcome for everyone in all ways. And the third point was simply that explanations shouldn't rely on groups or species level selection unless that's necessary. So the Neo-Darwinians argued you should always start at the individual and work up only if you have to. According to Wilson, David Sloan Wilson, the wholesale rejection of group selection was a wrong turn in evolutionary theory. He refers to this then as evolutionary theory's wrong turn. And by this, he means a neo-Darwinian focus on individuals. His remedy for this wrong turn is a new and improved kind of group selection and it's important to note that he's not proposing a return to platitudes about everything being for the good of the species. And instead, what makes the new group selection new is that it's multi-level. And to understand this, we can go back to Edward O. Wilson's iron rule of social evolution so Edward O. Wilson argued that an iron rule exists in genetic social evolution, whereby selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals within groups, while groups of altruists beat groups of selfish individuals. And that illustrates multi-level selection because we're looking both at what's happening in competition among individuals within groups as well as in terms of competition between groups of individuals taken as a whole. So David Sloan Wilson argues that a certain procedure is required in order to be able to observe group selection. And he outlines four steps. The first is to identify relevant trait groups. So you have to focus in on a behavior that you want to explain. The second is to compare the fitness of groups that are defined in terms of that specific trait. 
And the third is to compare the fitness of individuals within those groups. And then lastly, you sum up the joint outcomes, taking into account both the individual differences in fitness within groups and the difference in fitness between groups. So let's assume that if we had two groups here, and one of them had three cooperators and one defector, and the other had three defectors and one cooperator, what we should expect is that the group with more cooperators or altruists will do better as a group, but within each of those groups, the defectors will do better than the cooperators. And the challenge has always been to somehow demonstrate that what's happening at the group level can overpower what happens at the level of individuals. So let's run through an example of this. And the first step is to define a trait group. So we're going to use meerkats in the Kalahari. And it's well known that some meerkats stand as sentries and give alarms when predators approach. Other meerkats don't do that. So we're going to call the meerkats that give alarms cooperators and those that don't defectors. And here's the key to multi-level selection. It's based on the observation that individuals that alarm are more likely to be eaten but groups with more alarm colors are more likely to survive. The second step is to compare the fitness of the two groups. So in group A, we have three alarm colors and one non color The three cooperators who call are represented by the green circles and the non calling defector by red. Whereas in group B, we have one caller and three non-callers. So here we have three defectors and one altruist. And it's important to note that when we're starting out here, we have a 50-50 breakdown, four callers and four non-callers, but they're distributed unevenly across different groups. Now let's assume that in the first group, group A, the defecting non-caller is able to survive without alarming and uh, everyone else in the group also survives because you've got three alarm callers. And let's assume that in group B, that one altruist gets eaten first, but then there's nobody in the group who alarms to predators and so the non-callers get eaten one by one once that one altruist is gone. And if that were the case, the group with a preponderance of defectors would go extinct. And if that were the case, we'd move from a population as a whole with four callers and four non-callers to a population with 75% callers and 25% non-callers. And that's simply group A, where three out of four of the members call alarms. So what's happened there is once the group that has a preponderance of defectors goes extinct, the percentage of callers overall in the population goes up. And if that's the case, it means that the altruistic group has higher fitness. We can simply argue that groups where defection gets too high will go extinct. But we know that something's missing from our model, and this is the selfish individuals prevailing within the groups. So we left that out of the second step where we simply compared groups. So let's say that group A again has three callers and one non-caller, but what if the non-caller is able to free ride and the callers get eaten uh, one by one. So it works out that despite the fact that there's multiple alarmers, the free rider doesn't put himself at risk. And so that free rider survives. Uh, 
where the callers put themselves at risk and are more likely to be eaten. If that's the case, then even in groups that have a majority of altruists, the proportion of that group that's made up of defectors should rise. And this was the key to the neo-Darwinian argument that the frequency of defectors should simply rise within all groups. So what you have to explain is how cooperation can be viable at the level of individual interaction and interest. So what is required for group selection to actually operate? Well, imagine that we have a group of altruists and a group of defectors. Wilson argues, this is Edward O. Wilson in his book, The Superorganism, that positive between group selection must exceed negative within group selection. So that positive between group selection means that the groups of altruists must outgrow and replace the groups of defectors. And they have to do that at a higher rate than individual defectors replacing individual altruists within groups. So at the level of group selection, we expect that group of altruists to grow ever larger and split and form new colonies, while we expect the group of defectors to go extinct and ultimately to be replaced by the altruist. But there's a second process operating as well and to visualize that, let's start with a group that's mixed with one defector and three altruists. This group then gives rise to another group, which likewise has three altruists and one defector. And as that's happening, one of the altruists in the original group is being replaced by a defector. And then another group is born from that first group. And it also has three altruists and one defector. And at that point, another one of the altruists in the original group is replaced by a defector. And that group goes extinct. And meanwhile, these new groups continue to grow and split as well. And the idea is that through the rapid multiplication of new groups of altruists, even in a mixed population with some defectors, essentially the altruist will outrun at the group level the selection in favor of the defectors within the groups. More or less what the groups are doing is they're outrunning that internal rise of defection by being able to reproduce and split into new groups more quickly than the rate of defection within them. So fitness differences between groups have to exceed fitness differences between individuals within groups. And that's what's always seemed so unlikely. But David Sloan Wilson argues that two things might make that possible. And one, you have to increase the rate at which groups of cooperators replace groups of defectors at the group level. And he suggests one mechanism of this might be war. Edward O. Wilson argues the same thing, that it might be the explanation of war in terms of group level competition. And of course, ant colonies are also famous for fighting wars, just like human societies. The second possibility is a suppression or expulsion of defectors from cooperative groups through policing. And this simply means that you raise the cost of being a defector, and in doing that, you make defect much less likely. So you can suppress defection within groups, or you can increase the rate of, of extinction between groups and if either of those things are possible, then group selection might be possible as well. So there are two more arguments for group selection beyond these models for how a group level of selection might outrun individual selection. And the first points to implicit group selection in neo-Darwinian models.
The second argues that there's group-like cooperation in evolution as a whole, and given how ubiquitous group-like cooperation is, we simply have to come up with an explanation for it because it's actually happening. So let's look at the first one. And if we go back to the key neo-Darwinian models, one of those was based on kin selection and another on reciprocity. But both of those models require non-random interactions. So in terms of inclusive fitness, it doesn't work if kin can't interact preferentially. So a lot of you in making your observations said you had no kin close to share food with. In that circumstance, kin selection isn't going to be operating. And similarly, we noted that re reciprocators have to be able to find one another and that the probability that they're going to find one another decides whether reciprocity is viable. Well, if we think about it and we define these two groups uh, group A and group B, but they don't capture kin preferentially, or they don't capture reciprocators preferentially, but instead there's just this random distribution of defectors and cooperators who are interacting in unpatterned, unstructured ways, then arguably those neo-Darwinian models simply don't work. So some of you also said that you didn't practice reciprocity, you ate alone because there was nobody to reciprocate with, even though there's other people around. And what this points out is that it appears that there's a group level type of thinking going on in those classic neo-Darwinian individual models. The second argument in support of group selection is to question that whole meaning of an individual organism being the key uh, focus of selection. And proponents of group selection argue that individual organisms are better viewed as groups themselves. So one way we might think about this is the ecosystem in our gastrointestinal tract. It's estimated that each of us has something like 100 trillion bacteria that might belong to three or 400 different species and they're not just hanging out in our gastrointestinal tract, but they're basic to our ability to digest food and stay healthy. Another view of this is to look at the ways in which organisms reflect mergers of previously separate organisms. And this is the basic explanation for why we have mitochondria in all the cells in our body. The idea is that these mitochondria, these are these little organelles, uh, originally were separate bacteria and they merged with other bacteria and ultimately came to exist within them. So we went from single-celled prokaryotes to multi-celled eukaryotes uh, through a merger of prokaryotes. And that's called the theory of symbiosis but more broadly, this is called major transition theory. And the argument is that part of what happens in the major transitions of evolution is that previously separate individuals are merged into a larger unit, which is then itself the subject of selection. And if that's happened at the cellular level, uh, then what's to think it can't happen in terms of social life? So the second key argument made uh, by group selection proponents is that our sense that we're individual organisms might be misplaced. Thank you for listening.